Welcome to Soulful Kitchen Podcast. I'm Sun, the Bohemian Vegan. This Own Your Health series is all about the journey to intuitive healing and living in optimal health. Today I want to explain some of the hidden nasties that labels can be deceptive about. This may not be the first time you've heard this, but I want to be very specific regarding whether these are fact or myth and reveal some items that even vegans may not be aware of. Hey guys, Happy New Year and welcome back. I apologize and I didn't mention in my last podcast about being away over the Christmas break. Well, that kind of extended into January because I had microphone issues. So I finally got my new microphone and here we are back with another podcast. So I had a lovely time relaxing um, though through that time and taking advantage of having a break. And that kind of leads me to a little bit of a deviation on the topic for today. Before I get into the hidden ingredients, and hidden labels is that I want to talk to you about digital detoxing. That's something I usually do a couple of times a year. And to be honest, I'm actually thinking of doing it a little bit more to avoid, you know, the typical things like burnout or just just to refresh myself, which means if I'm fresh, I have more um, to give my audience. So I'll keep you posted though when um, I'm going to do that. I promise you this time, unless of course I have a problem with my microphone again. It is really hard to break away from this kind of normal way of living now where we are completely tuned in to having devices with us all the time. And it's a way that, you know, even someone who says that they don't spend a lot of time on their digital devices, you know, it's a lot compared to years ago before we were so, so committed to having them. And, you know, it becomes like an appendage to us to have a phone at least. But sometimes we just need to recharge our own battery. So it's really important to take note of a few things that I kind of took note of in that period as well. And if we're, if you've ever listened to any of my other podcasts, you'd probably be aware that I have lived in Israel. I spent a lot of time immersing myself in the culture there and the religion. You're probably asking what that has to do with digital detoxing. Well, actually, that was where I started to digital detox. But of course, in Israel, they call it Shabbat, um, not specifically for digital detoxing, but definitely for giving ourselves a chance to rest. And pretty much that is, I guess, a loose translation of what Shabbat means. So the one thing I did take away with me after leaving Israel was to give myself a day in the week that I had downtime from life. And what that does by Monday morning, because I usually do it on a Sunday, which I'd like to point out in Israel, the Jewish religion um, actually does do it from sunset on Friday to sunset on Saturday. But I essentially find Sunday is a better day for me and my name is Sun. So it seems kind of appropriate to have my day off on Sunday. And so I will do it from sundown Saturday to basically the whole of Sunday night. By Monday morning, when I'm ready to get back into my work, I feel so much more refreshed. And as a sufferer, if you've heard my other podcast, you will know that I have been in the past and obviously still do suffer from autoimmune diseases. And this has been throughout my entire life. So, you know, while I am a sufferer of it, I have learned to live my lifestyle and my diet to suit and uh, around, you know, keeping those autoimmune diseases at bay. So, and to not have issues with them as much as what I used to for sure. And so I can live as normal life as I can as possible. So that was always something that my body, I guess, when I have this this detox every week and particularly when I have like a complete digital detox, but I'd say my, you know, version of Shabbat is a really good way that to relax and unwind and to really not think about things. So I spend a lot of time 
you know, if something pops into my head, I just quickly write it down. I don't even grab my phone because if I grab my phone, I'm likely to then get on, you know, checking messages and whatever. So I just kind of quickly scribble it down or if I have my notes open on my phone, I will quickly put it in there and that's it. It's gone out of my head and I can deal with it on Monday. And I guess my mind really appreciates it, but so does my body. Like when I'm relaxed, when I'm resting, you know, and I just keep everything at a light kind of way the whole day, my thoughts, my body, I don't even really do yoga. Sometimes I'll do maybe some light movement, definitely just some light walking with my dog. Every week, I so look forward to it now. You know, I I, I guess I do feel as if, You know, sometimes we can get so busy in this techie social media world and we do forget to give ourselves a daily time limit as well. And we tend to be on our phones and other devices a lot more. I think it's an important message to share with others because I think, yeah, we get away from ourselves. And this message, I guess, to you is is that for me, it's really important for all of us when we are feeling as if we are moving towards burnout or getting sick to just take a break. Like that's your body telling you that it's time to just stop and listen to what your body is telling you or even the thoughts that are generating in your mind. And when you listen to that, you will find yourself, you know, really honoring what your body or your mind really needs. So tune into those thoughts because they are usually correct. Taking that time out is good for all of us. Go outside and relish in that vitamin D from that wonderful sunshine and make sure you're taking in good nutrition as well and focus on keeping yourself healthy and alive, not just working like a machine. Even though you probably don't realize you're doing it, you are because it's a it's a cycle, it's a routine. And so, you know, when we take a break, you know, like when you go on holidays and it takes you like a few days to literally get into the swing of being on holidays. So, um, yeah, that, that's a really important message that I'd like to share with everyone. And yeah, I hope that you take some, um, something away from it. But today I did want to talk more about nutrition. So I will get back to the autoimmune diseases and and other kind of disorders that people can have, particularly the candida, which I talked about before, and obviously my knowledge of Ayurveda. But at the moment, I really do want to spend some time on what I feel is a really important thing, especially if you're new to being vegan, because, and we've just had Veganuary, to have this information available to you so that you can you know, understand about hidden labels, because even as a vegan, when I studied this part of my nutritionist course, I was actually really shocked, even though I was already vegan, that there were certain labels that I wasn't even aware of. So, you know, I probably did know something about it, but I didn't, and a lot of it I did, but I also feel like a majority of it, I was like, really? I never knew that, you know? So I kind of wanted to share that with everyone today. So that's why I picked this topic. So my focus is more aligned to healing and nutrition now. And while they both can be food aligned, they are also so much more. And that's where today's episode is going to come from because even though I'm usually standing in those shopping aisles, you know, uh, looking at the ingredients and I live in Mexico, so I'm having to decipher them in Spanish back to English. And sometimes that doesn't quite work as well. A lot damn harder than most people have to endure, but also means I have to know the hidden labels or the names for them in the local language. So in India, there was hundreds of dialects with, I think, Roughly around 22 specific languages are spoken there, which is huge. Thankfully, in the years I was there, I stuck mostly to one area, so one state of India. And eventually, after much research, I was able to feel safe that what I was purchasing was actually vegan. So before I really get into um, like the hidden labels, I do think it's worth mentioning, and I will obviously put these in the show notes, And it will help you to stop standing in the shopping aisle longer than you actually need to. So the first thing is always do your research, like know what you're shopping for, know what the hidden labels are. And the thing is, 
that there are so many that that can be quite overwhelming. So I guess with knowing insight what you're generally buying, that's going to help you. And like, honestly, for me, I try to just stay away from, from things that are packaged, you know, that have preservatives in it, because that's usually where these kind of, you know, non-vegan things are in the food. And I know that's really hard for new vegans, but at some point we were all there and it's a learning experience. So don't think that, you know, you've done a bad thing because you accidentally messed up or anything. So yeah, do your research first because there are tons of websites out there. And of course, my most favorite one for if I really want to get into the in-depth side of it, I will always look at Peter, which has a comprehensive list of alternative names for hidden non-vegan food. The other thing I, I guess I would do is, you know, find brands that I know. So once I know it's vegan, I'm going to probably end up buying that same brand again. And, you know, even if like in Mexico and in India, it doesn't necessarily mean that the items are labeled vegan because it's not really a thing, maybe more so in India now, but definitely not in Mexico. You know, it's slowly starting to be there, but there are a lot of things that are not written as vegan but are vegan. And I, I guess if you're not sort of, or if you're living in your home country, you might find that a lot easier. But, you know, if you're listening to this and you're in a country that is primarily not really veganized yet, this tip will probably help you as well. So yeah, find brands that you know that are vegan, but always be aware of any changes in packaging. So this has happened to me before as well. So in case they update their ingredients and this happened to me recently with actually an oat brand. Now, again, I'll mention I'm not living in a, you know, a Western veganized country, but the oat brand was a hundred percent. There wasn't anything added to it. And it, it does act, one thing I'll say about Mexico is they do talk about gluten. So, you know, if something is sin gluten it means that there's no gluten so they're quite good at labeling that and this oat brand changed their packaging then i realized yeah that they weren't actually gluten free anymore so possibly maybe they you know with the labeling system they got found out that they weren't actually ve uh, sorry gluten free i don't know but yeah so it was a real sad day for me because i was so used to being able to easily access these now i have to actually look online for a gluten free brand and also, as I mentioned before, try to buy as close to whole plant-based foods as possible, which will alleviate the headache of trying to remember all the hidden ingredients that are out there. So while researching, I find a good list. Uh, there are actually, you know, many apps out there now, a lot more than what I actually probably had when I was going vegan. And I'll leave that in the show notes, but it, there's, a, there's a link to a website that lists, um, it's called Live Kindly, and it basically lists quite a few apps. But even if, you know, researching for this, I found tons and tons of new stuff on, um, you know, Play Store. And I guess, you know, if you're um, an Apple user, you'll find it on there as well but in the Apple store, but, um, you know, it also depends from country to country. So of course my favorite is happy cow when I'm traveling. I find that is one of the best apps to use because it is, you know, used by so many vegans. So yeah, the market is always evolving. So just keep checking for new apps relevant to the year of release and what you're particularly after. Now let's talk about what vegans avoid. So it might seem like a lot of time is spent in the kitchen preparing condiments, sauces, cheeses, etc. You know, that it would be easier to just go to the supermarket and buy them. Now, I don't have that luxury, obviously, but many people do. But the problem is with that is that you are also risking the chance of added salt, sugar, and things to preserve that food that's going to be put into it. So Honestly, that five minutes it takes to throw something in a blender or a food processor is just going to make you much more aware that what you're putting into your diet is 100% what you know the ingredients are. And we're going to talk about that too, because there are a lot of ingredients that aren't even labeled as a name and tend to have a number, and they're the ones you usually need to watch out for the most. And that's not just with vegan labels that's also with you know just things that are bad for you to eat so okay but you'll probably find 
doing this by preparing your own food that you're going to find that you're eating much healthier and also getting the nutrients that you actually need and in the doses that you actually need and it's you know enjoyable to just throw those things together it honestly takes me no time in the kitchen to make a cheese it's probably minimum 15 minutes maybe maximum 30 minutes to do that and I think it's, you know, much more stress-free experience than standing in the aisles of a supermarket trying to work out what you actually are eating. And not to mention that it is extremely rewarding. Okay, so it goes without saying that vegans avoid all meat of any kind, as well as any byproducts of an animal. But some vegans are more strict than others, and some are plant-based for health as opposed to vegan for the animals. Of course, it doesn't matter because um, no one should be judged for their choices, and this list will help to clarify what vegans avoid in their daily lives. But also what you have to understand is that, as I said, no judgment. If you're making your contribution Whichever way you look at it, whether you're plant-based, vegan, or whatever, you are still helping to save the animals. Okay, so let's start with the most obvious things. Absolutely all animal meat is not vegan. Organ meat from animals, also not vegan. Poultry, fish, and seafood, including anchovies. Eggs from any animal. Dairy and milk products from any animal. Hidden dairy ingredients like whey, lactose, casein are all ingredients vegans should definitely avoid as they are derived from dairy products. Fur or skin from any animal and gelatin, which of course, you know, most people learn this pretty close to becoming vegan and don't realize it or learn it just after they can't become vegan. But gelatin is a protein that's actually derived from animal bones. Yeah, disgusting, right? I know myself that I have become much more aware since becoming vegan that I can no longer stand the smell of eggs or cheeses, which is which is surprising because I ate those two things quite a lot. I really actually found it very hard to give up yogurt when I became vegan, um, not so much the cheese and you know the other dairy products, but I was eating eggs like every day. So I was told to be on a high protein diet when I was a vegetarian and so that's what I followed. And it was a very hard and difficult thing to give up all those high protein foods and have to work out a way to substitute them as a vegan. And that's the thing, like we tend to forget that we still need to have our protein and our carbs and our, you know, fats, but obviously we have to replace them with vegan versions of them. So we shouldn't lose sight of our nutrition, you know, values just because we come become vegan. But I do think once you become vegan for the animals, it's like a double-sided coin. So on one side, your sensory awareness becomes more sharpened. And on the other side is the ethical awareness of animal cruelty. But again, I'm going to say, don't, don't let your nutrition, like the value of your own nutrition become less just because of becoming vegan. It's still a very important thing to be aware of. And I actually think studying any kind of, you know, whether it's anatomy or nutrition or anything that kind of gets down to understanding those values is very good. And I'll have to say that recently I decided to start documenting, um, probably because of the vegan nutrition course, to document what I was eating in a day. Like I, I have a very standardized diet that I've created for myself but since being in Mexico some of the items that I would have been having in India when I devised this on an Ayurvedic perspective I can't get here and one of them is tofu which was my main source of protein like you know on a daily basis well not maybe daily basis but very close to it not having that I didn't realize you know like I probably wasn't substituting it enough with other proteins to get the level up so I decided to go on chronometer and, you know, years ago when I was trying to lose weight, I was looking at it from, you know, the calories that I had and wasn't really looking at it from the nutrition value. And I actually, when I've added in over the past few days, all the things that I eat, which, as I said, it tends to be very similar from day to day. One of the things I've noticed is that my calcium, my B12 and my calcium levels were actually with the B12, it was non-existent. And with the calcium level, it was um, 
probably not even halfway. So a little bit of history with me, even before I was vegan, my B, I used to have to have vitamin B shots because my energy would go low. And I think that had a lot to do with the undiagnosed autoimmune disorders. So as a vegan, I continued that, but I haven't done that since being in Mexico. I haven't found someone who well, I haven't really gone looking, but I have noticed recently that my, my health has deteriorated a little bit with energy and I had a migraine the first time I'd had a migraine in years, like we're talking probably six, seven years since I've had a migraine. So it was really interesting. So that was probably what sparked me to go on a little adventure and find out, you know, what exactly am I eating? So my protein level is still a little bit down, but I'm definitely working on that. But it was really interesting to see where, you know, whether I was getting the right nutrients, macro and micronutrients into my body and obviously the vitamins and minerals, but the calcium, um, sorry, the vitamin B I could address because just a couple of taste tablespoons of fortified nutritional yeast would give me enough of that daily intake. So while I sometimes add it to food, again, I haven't been adding it so much because I haven't been making some things that I would normally make and adding it to it to there. So I'm working on getting that up naturally and possibly going back to taking my vitamin B shots. But then on the calcium side was where I was actually really, really shocked because when we talk about nutrition and you talk about a vegan plate, you talk about having percentages, you know, of vegetables, nuts and seeds, fruits and legumes, and there's a percentage that you should be having. Out of all of those food groups that should be on your plate, basically a quarter of each of each of those food groups, not a quarter of everything on your plate, but a quarter of all those food groups should be calcium rich foods. So when you look at the plate, you know, every single food group, a quarter of those food groups should have calcium and rich foods in there. And so I was actually very shocked and I realized that it's actually to do with I also can't get leafy greens. So when I was in India, there's a lot of farms in the area in which I lived and they would, I would get one or two deliveries of greens every week. And so, you know, every meal had dark leafy greens in it. So yeah, this is something I'm going to be having to work on for myself. But at, getting back to what I was saying before, you knowing your nutrition, like what you're intaking, and when you look at your own food, and we're not talking about calories, we're talking about you know, the protein and the carbs and the energy and the fat is that we look at that and we should know are the foods that I'm eating reaching the percentage that they should be on a daily basis. And we don't really think about that. And it's something that we should really think about on a daily basis. And once you kind of get a handle on it, then you'll realize that you don't need to be doing it ongoing so much because you'll have a much bigger awareness of it. And most people do have a very similar diet. So you'll notice straight away that you will instantly be able to see, like I did, where there is a problem, you know, where you might be having some deficiency. And another thing I do want to say is that I have been deficient in calcium before. Like I've had my Ayurvedic doctor when they took my blood and did some testing on me quite a few years back when I first arrived in India and was having a lot of health problems. I was on calcium tablets even back then as a um, supplement. So it doesn't really surprise me, but I guess back then I was using food as a way, you know, through the leafy greens and other calcium rich foods to basically counteract that. And after a while, so I didn't need to keep taking the supplement. So I am finding it a little bit difficult to find um, these types of foods here and most likely I will go on to supplements and I'll continue to use Chronometer just to keep a record until I know that I've found the foods here that have high calcium value in them and are particularly good for me. To keep a handle on actually what I'm doing with my food and as I say, most people do just go from day to day eating very similar types of food. I don't think you need to do it every single day after you've kind of like worked out what foods have what vitamins, but I do think it's very important, you know, just to get an idea in the initial stages of your health, look at your food, always look at your food before anything. Even when you have a cold, 
there could or or the flu there can be underlying issues of something that you're deficient in so if you're deficient in something you're going to be more prone to getting sick and it's the same for other kind of disorders and diseases that you might get always look at your diet and your lifestyle before you start you know worrying about it being something really big and i'm not saying not to go to the doctors definitely go to the doctors if you feel but if you're coming back with results that are negative and was happening with me years ago and they're not giving you any reasons for you to be sick or having you know an ongoing problem definitely always look at your diet it's very important This next list includes ingredients that most, but not necessarily all vegans avoid. So the first is leather. Vegans do not tend to wear leather or use leather accessories as it is an animal product made from cow hides or other animals. Wool is also something vegans generally don't wear because it is an animal product processed from sheep. Silk, vegans do not wear silk as it is made by silkworms. Do you know how many people actually don't know that? It's um, quite an eye-opener when you do discover that. Bee products, vegans do not consume or use bee products such as beeswax or royal jelly found in beauty products and honey. There are some vegans, and uh, there's no judgment here because I'm not someone who does use bee products, but there is quite a debate in the vegan community over this. But you just have to decide whether you feel that, you know, bees are being harmed to create this. And for me personally, I definitely feel that it is a product of an environment. We are receiving honey and these other things due to the bees being kept in captivity and being bred for that particular purpose. So in my eyes, yes, it, it shouldn't be something that we eat or have in our beauty products. Shellac, which is also most commonly found in nail varnish, wood finish and food glaze, and is the, it is another disgusting one for me. It is the secretion of the lac insect found mostly in India and Thailand. Which also brings me to cochineal. I think that's how we say it. Um, vegans do not consume cochineal because, and surprisingly, this is actually another insect um, called the cochineal insect, but it's found mostly in red dye, which we use for coloring food, right, and cosmetics. So that's one that a lot of people probably aren't even aware of. So it's important to make sure that you also know any other hidden names for the cochineal insect. Okay, next up, I'm gonna talk about the various food additives that uh, appear in food and some hidden ingredients that even vegans might not be aware of. And again, there's, there's so much that we have to remember. And also when, you know, when we become vegan, we primarily, most people become vegan because of the animals, but we don't realize, you know, all these hidden ingredients are actually in our foods and our beauty products. And so, you know, it is a process, as I mentioned earlier, it is a process. You don't just turn vegan and know everything. So if you are starting out to be vegan, I hope that you find this really informative and that it is a process, you know, so you don't, don't think that you are going to know everything overnight. And I mean, as much research and as many videos and things that you watch, documentaries, they're all going to help you to understand and just going vegan is probably one of the best things that you can do and learn. And I think what we have to understand too, transitioning from anything, like any habit that you have, is a transition process into a new habit. And habits take a while to break. So we have to be very kind to ourselves during that process. But transitioning from an, an omnivorous diet into a vegan diet can seriously be very challenging. And I guess for most people, you know, going through the different ways that you can do this. So for me, it was cold turkey. I just decided that I was not going to eat any more, that I was just going to go vegan overnight. And kind of, it was kind of like a joke between friends. And I decided that I would go from my vegetarian diet to a vegan diet if someone or I 
if my friend and I could create a vegan yoga that was parallel to a Greek yoga, because we're not just talking about any yoga here. And also back then, there wasn't as much range. Um, this was in Australia. So there wasn't as much range of products as what there are now. That was the reason I went vegan. But I pretty much had given up cheese because of being celiac. And I had given up dairy anyway. And so I wasn't really eating anything that was dairy except for the yogurt. And even when I was in India, I would eat curd, which is the equivalent to their style of yogurt. And then, yeah, that was it. So, you know, I, I did go to cold turkey, but there are other ways to transition into a vegan diet. So sometimes, like, I guess I went cold turkey from vegetarian to vegan, but I didn't go cold turkey from omnivorous to vegan. So I did go from an omni to vegetarian, but I was vegetarian for many years. And then I just started getting curious about vegan because I went vegetarian for my diet, not for the animals. And I will have to say that it was purely for the animals that I went vegan. Then, you know, you can also gradually reduce your meat and dairy in your diet. There's nothing wrong with that as well. It's just really important that the main things that you want to keep up is your energy. And the main thing that causes deficiency in in energy is insufficient protein or insufficient iron in your diet or insufficient calories. So even though you might be thinking that you have to reduce your calories, you have to be very careful. Like I said earlier, is that you make sure that you are, you know, keeping up with what you should be having per your body weight and, and all the other factors that come into it and making sure that you're getting all of the major food groups into your diet and making sure that the macro, the micronutrients and every other vitamin is at the optimum of what it should be. So if you lack in those and get become like deficient in those, that's when we're going to have the protein insufficiency as well as the iron um, insufficiency. And that means disease and becoming sick. And the digestive system works very closely with the immune system. If your digestive system, that second brain is not producing what it needs to or not functioning well, then you're going to have problems with your immune system most likely. I think it's around, they say around 90% of our serotonin supply is actually found in the digestive tract and in our blood platelets. And yeah, so even though we think serotonin is produced in and manufactured in the brain, where it does perform its primary functions, this percentage of it is produced in the gut. So if your gut is healthy and the serotonin levels are good, and remember serotonin is your happy mood enhancer hormone. So if that is that if that's working really well, your immune system is in a much better position than if it's compromised because you're lacking or you're deficient in certain minerals, vitamins, and so on. I also think that, you know, like talking about insufficient calories, it's really important to understand that, you know, while we can solve the problem of insufficient protein and insufficient iron in the diet, we also have to be very aware that not eating enough can be a big problem because then you're not going to get the the calories that you need because plant-based foods have a calorie density that is much lower than animal-based foods. So if you're not eating enough, you're not going to get your calories. And this can also, like lack of calories can cause low energy levels. So just, yeah, remember to eat (laughs) and keep in mind that you may require a higher volume of food than someone who is an omnivore and, or, and also, you know, obviously avoid vegan junk foods because they just are not nutritionally sound. It's okay to balance that out if you already have a very high It's okay to balance that out. I will be the first to admit that I like to include a little bit of sweet in my day, but it definitely is in comparison to the other food groups, something that is of a lower amount. And also that comes from my understanding of having all six tastes, which comes from my Ayurveda training as well. You may even be surprised to know that many people find out that switching to a vegan diet can actually cause temporary emotional difficulties. So this happens because when animal products are eliminated from the diet, the hormones in the body can actually be affected by that. So this effect is particularly pronounced if the diet change is made on a cold turkey basis. 
I don't remember going through any kind of emotional changes when I went vegan, um, but that could have been because I did have that transition of many years in between being a vegetarian. So I guess what you have to understand, though, is the body takes a while to adapt to the hormonal changes which are caused by the diet change. So this means it takes some time before hormones can stabilize. So for a period of time, you might find that you experience feelings such as anxiety, depression, fuzzy head, or I like to say foggy brain, tearfulness, sadness, even anger. So it's okay because over time, those feelings will go away and the emotional system will return to normal. In fact, emotional outcomes may even improve on a long-term basis. And over time, due to the vegan diet, that you stabilize more. And that's because the the vegan diet actually excludes the excess hormones that we actually are derived from animal-based products that are included in an omnivorous diet. And the absence of these hormones in the long term can actually have a benefit on the body or on the emotional health side of things. And I'd even say headaches. Headaches and skin issues can also be problematic in the beginning. And this is usually um, because, again, the body is detoxing. And if that's the case, you really should try and eat as clean as possible, eliminating processed foods and foods that are difficult to digest. This will give the body and digestive system the space to work out all the old toxins and other harmful substances in the body and gut. And then you should see improvements in your skin and your headaches or any other problems that you might be having. The ones you most probably need to understand the most are the E number ingredients. So I'm going to list them and then I'm going to talk a little bit about them. So E120, E322, E422, E471, E542, E631, E901 and E904. So vegans do avoid them. And there's really main reasons why, and most of it does come down, obviously, to the animal products that you find. But if you group the E additives, I will leave this in the show notes as well. So there'll be a link to an explanation about the the group. So from 1 to 199, 200 to 299, and so on. So let's just do an overview now. So 1 to 199, there are food coloring And of course, that comes down to what we talked about before, the cochineal dye. So that is the E120. When we look at the next group, uh, it's 200 to 299, and that generally is preservatives. Now, while we don't have anything listed in what I previously gave you, these, to me, are a preservative that we still should be careful with just for our normal health, because These preservatives prevent the growth of microbes in food that might make us sick. So E220, for example, is sulfur dioxide, a preservative commonly used in wine to stop acidic or acid bacteria from turning the wine into vinegar. So, you know, it's not something that is affecting what you're eating or drinking that is not vegan, but just for your general health, I think it's really valuable to know these different labels as well. The E322 is covers lethargens and that is plural because it covers all types of lethargen. When you see E322 listed as an ingredient you need to be careful because you may think that it's going to be covering lethargen from soya but also it can cover from egg, dairy or anything else and as such it's rather confusing. So unless the product itself is clearly marked as being suitable for vegans, yeah, assume that it isn't. But 400 to 499, which is thickeners, emulsifiers, and stabilizers. Now these thickeners are commonly used in soups or sauces. Emulsifiers help keep oily substances and watery substances mixed, such as mayonnaise, which of course is not vegan. But without emulsifiers, the oily and watery part can separate as seen in like vinaigrettes and things like that. 
Okay, let's talk about E422, which is glycerol or glycerine, and that is a natural carbohydrate alcohol, usually derived more from animals, but it can be sometimes derived from vegetable fat. So a little bit of a hard one to follow, um, but yeah, it, it should have somewhere on the label, whether it's from animal or from vegetable, you would hope. Um, basically, it is commercially produced in two main ways, synthetically from propane or by bacterial fermentation of sugars. And it is present mostly in chewy types of sweets. I just tend to avoid them unless they, you know, say that they're vegan. The other thing that it can come in is cakes and confectionery products of any kind. So yeah, you know, I used to be a big fan of gummy bears and um, Starburst and all those kind of things before going vegan. And of course, well, back then um, when I first went vegan, I don't know if they are now because I try to avoid sugar. Yeah, but way back then they were definitely not vegan. So I just learned to live without them. So let's speak about the 470 group. All of those relate back to glycerol. So, you know, they're different labels and obviously different fatty acids from different types. So it's, again, not, not going to be definitely always not vegan. If you see something with glycerol or something that suggests that it's coming from fatty acids, I would probably suggest that if it's not got vegan on the label, there's a good chance that it's not going to be vegan. And, you know, in my case where I don't live in countries that have labeling systems for vegans, it is, you know, and there probably are people out there in the same situation as me, I'm sure, just be aware from, yeah, 470 right through to 480, I think it is, or 479, that you'll find uh, that they're actually all related back to the fatty acids. Okay, so the 500 to 599, they're usually what we would call acidity regulators and anti-caking agents. So you find your sodium bicarbonates and baking soda and bicarb soda and all that kind of thing in this, and it regulates acidity in food. But 542, so E542, is actually not made, um, is, is not vegan. And the most disgusting thing about this one is it's made from edible bone phosphate. So what the hell is edible bone phosphate, you ask? Well, it comes from animal bones of cattle or pigs, sometimes used in cosmetics, toothpaste, nutritional supplements, and in dry food such as anti-caking agent to prevent the particles sticking together. So it's crazy what we find in our food that we are just so oblivious to. And I guess we've just desensitized what's actually in food because we're not, it's not fresh. It's not something we're cooking ourselves. We're buying it has in, you know, preservatives and has all these ingredients and in these hidden labels or hidden ingredients in the labels, which means that we're not really aware of what the food we are eating and consuming that's going into our body. So of course we become desensitized. And if we're desensitized about the food, it's because we're not thinking what is on my plate? What actually am I eating? And we're just you know, eating what we want rather than working out exactly what it is that's going into our body. I'm very passionate about this in case you didn't notice, but yes, I, it blows my mind because I'm vegan and I've been vegan for a while. It makes me crazy because there are so many people still not aware of it, and I think becoming vegan really brings an overall awareness to so many things that prior to being vegan I had no clue about. So me doing a podcast is my way of helping and contributing to that awareness. So I hope that the people that are listening to it to this, that you walk away with a little bit more knowledge than you had before you started listening to it. Okay, 600 to 699, we're almost at the end by the way flavor enhancers and includes monsodium glutamate which is e621 which in simpler terms just means msg the thing about msg is that there's a lot of controversy over this and i probably do believe this was more propaganda than anything else but of course everyone has their opinion and so therefore a lot of people say msg is bad and other people say it's not the one that we do need to watch out for the most is E631. And E631 is not vegan. It's also known as disodium inosinate. 
It is a flavor enhancer food additive often found in instant noodles, potato chips, and other snacks. So it is usually derived from meat and fish, but can be produced veganly from tapioca starch. You know, any even though potato is vegan, the additives that are put into it, all those flavors, which comes under this E631, are not generally vegan. Okay, 700 to 999. These are your sweeteners, your foaming agents, and the gases used to package food. The ones to watch out for in the 900s would be the E901, which is a glazing agent and made from beeswax. So probably not as disgusting as some of the other food labels that I've mentioned, but E904 is one of those ones that we've talked about previously, and that is made from shellac, female lac bug. And that label is given to it, obviously, to hide what really it is. So E904 is definitely not vegan. Whether you're on the fence about products made from bees being vegan or not, definitely this one, E904, is 100% not vegan. want to move into some other really probably the most disgusting things I've ever heard ever when I found out that I you know and actually most of them I found out after I was vegan so the first one is ising glass this is actually a substance derived from the fish bladders used in the making of wine and beer Blah. lanolin which is found in many cosmetics is the grease extracted from sheep's wool, which vegans should, if they don't already, avoid. Yeah, so lanolin is like in everything. I remember it. My grandmother used to be like, oh, put lanolin on your skin. Not thinking where it was coming from. I had no understanding of what lanolin was. Just a cream that made my skin feel nice and soft and, and not itchy anymore. Rennet. Vegans avoid this ingredient used in cheese making as it, as it is actually an enzyme found in the stomach of lambs and calves. It is just, just, just grossing me out even talking about it. Anyway, omega-3 fatty acids. So vegans generally avoid these as they are most often derived from fish. Um, looking for algae-based alternatives is where we tend to get our omega-3s because we shouldn't avoid them. And even though they're a fatty acid, omega-3s and obviously omega-6s are very good for us. But omega-3s can be found in many different things, particularly nuts and seeds. I personally love throwing chia seeds on everything and that boosts my omega-3 up for the day. And then there is vitamin D3. So vegans avoid this as most vitamin D3 comes from lanolin or fish oil. So we're right back to the lanolin. All right, so there are many other food products that you would expect to be vegan, but actually are not, or are sometimes not. So some vegans are aware of this and avoid these products, while others are, I would just say, less observant. And these include beer and wine. Some varieties are made using ising glass, which I mentioned before, that disgusting fish bladder. Others are used casein, gelatin, or egg white during the manufacturing process rendering the final product clearly not vegan. Bread products such as loaves, pastries and bagels may also include L-cysteine, a softening agent sourced from poultry feathers. Candies, which, um, you know, I did love my candy back in the day, but I just now avoid all candies because of knowing these things. So candies, chewing gum and sweets, many candy sweets and chewing gum contain carmine, shellac and gelatin. Crisps and potato chips, while crisps themselves are vegan, which I mentioned before, flavorings may not be. And this is usually when we add like powdered cheeses and milk proteins, meats and fish and things like that to flavor the chips. Dark chocolate. Now, while I'm a big fan of dark chocolate, most brands of dark chocolate actually are vegan. However, read your labels with this one because sometimes while they'll say dark chocolate or we assume that dark chocolate is actually always going to be vegan, it's not. And if you read the label, it'll either say that it contains milk or milk products or it might have that it has been manufactured on a machine that you know has milk products or dairy products. 
So it will, you know, quite often feature as that. So you really need to make your decision if it's just, you know, on a machinery that has contained milk products because it may contain them, doesn't necessarily has contained them. But I guess, yeah, it's a very personal choice. But essentially, if we're drawing the line down the middle, not vegan. Deep fried foods, so onion rings and other deep fried foods that might seem vegan may not be because the batter that they use does contain eggs. And then there's my favorite French fries. Well, I have to just stick to having French fries at home because if I eat them out, I do take the risk and, you know, the jeopardizing of my own vegan morals. And that is that French fries are often fried in animal fat. It makes sense though, because obviously there are products that you know if you go to like a fish and chip shop in Australia there's going to be you know deep fried food that is meat and other like fish and things like that and it's the same oil they're using for the french fries so again I guess it's a matter of judgment I have been known to eat french fries out and just you know obviously have to not question it but that's usually when there's absolutely nothing vegan on the menu not by choice non-dairy products even though some products claim to be non-dairy they may still include casein which is protein that comes from a milk source olive tapenade olive tapenade often contains anchovies rendering it definitely unsuitable for vegans i do love olive tapenade and i will always look for you know or make it myself because it's a good one to you know just put together very quickly pasta many types of pastas actually do contain eggs pesto I'm a, this is one of the condiments I will always make myself, but while it might seemingly be vegan, many pesto brands in the supermarket definitely include Parmesan cheese because that is one of the ingredients that is meant to be in pesto. So I would use nutritional yeast and sometimes miso to make that cheesy kind of flavor in the pesto. And sometimes I don't because sunflower seeds, which I actually make my pesto from, has a kind of cheesy sort of smell to it once you let it sit for you know a few hours in water so it does kind of get that cheesy kind of smell to it and therefore taste to it refined sugar well this is an interesting one because sometimes sugar is lightened using natural carbon which is in fact another gross one bone char which is made from cattle bones instead vegans should really opt for um, evaporated cane juice or organic sugar or something like if you're going to go for sweeteners you know your maple syrup and your agave but really check the labels again because quite often they will add sugar into those products and and in that case there shouldn't be a label saying that it's vegan and finally the very last one that i'm going to talk about today is roasted peanuts so to help the salt and spices stick to the peanuts gelatin is sometimes used in the manufacturing process oh there is one more actually worcestershire sauce this or sauce may contain anchovies. So I don't know if anyone knows that, but yeah, you need to look again for Worcestershire sauce that may not be labeled vegan, but just look for the ingredients and hope that it is in English, not like where I live, and um, look up to see whether it's got fish or anchovies in it because yeah, Worcestershire sauce is a big one for that. Okay, so that is actually it. And I hope I have taught you something this week because that was a lot of research that I had to do for this podcast. I do know a lot, but it's actually the memory. I have a really bad memory at remembering things and mostly those numbers, like they do my head in because, you know, they're numbers. Anyway, I hope that you all have a lovely rest of your day or week until my next podcast, which actually I'll be truthfully honest with. I haven't thought of a topic yet, but there's so, well, let's say I haven't picked one of the topics yet that I'm going to talk about. So if there is something that you'd like me to elaborate more on from previous podcasts, uh, please send me a message. You can contact me through the normal channels, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. And also I want to just have a little bit of a plug here. I have started my own Patreon page. So hop on over there because I have some great exclusive bonus stuff not just the podcast but also videos and particularly recipes that I'm not revealing to the public only through the Patreon exclusive program so yeah if you're interested in that you can find all the details in my link tree link in the show notes until next week take care lovelies so I hope that you live your life in good health eat lightly breathe deeply 
live moderately, cultivate cheerfulness, and maintain an interest in life. Namaste. Thank you.